Hi, my name is Walid Abdullahi. I'm the director of Ceres, the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences. And with regard to the question, can space do more to support action on climate change? The first part of my answer to that is space has already done plenty. But the second part is, yes, of course, it can do more to support action. Um, as far as what it has done, the space-based perspective has provided foundational knowledge and information. In other words, the data to help us understand climate change and inform action. And it does this in part by uh, allowing us to access otherwise inaccessible places, the Arctic, uh, the middle of the Sahara Desert, the, the Amazon rainforest. Now, we can go to these places, but to observe large-scale behavior really requires satellite observations. Um, the second is the space-based perspective allows us to see the world in ways our eyes can't. By using the full part of the electromagnetic spectrum, ultraviolet, microwave radiation, thermal infrared, in addition to visible, we're able to quote unquote see things that our eyes otherwise couldn't. Um, and the third is perspective. You know, the large scale perspective of global processes in the Earth system and the interactions among the elements of the Earth system. So what have space-based observations told us with regard to climate change that have helped us understand the situation? Um, well, I'm just going to give you a few examples that illustrate the points I made before about how we observe from space and what that enables us to do. The first is the shrinking Arctic sea ice cover. We're, we're all aware that over the last several decades, Arctic sea ice has been shrinking substantially. We know this because of satellite observations. If we physically went a few hundred miles above the Earth and looked down at the Arctic, we wouldn't see the sea ice. The clouds would be in the way. But because we measure it with microwave wave or at microwave wavelengths, the microwaves penetrate the clouds and we're able to see the ice below and its behavior. And so we can see in the late 70s compared to just last year, substantial losses of Arctic sea ice cover. Another area that's, that's close to home for me is wildfires. Um, again, the satellite observations allow us to see fires on a continental scale. Their number, their duration, their intensity, and subsequently the fire damage that's done, uh, the spatial extent of these fires. Looking from space helps us get a sense of of the behavior of these fires and their evolution with time, both evolution within a fire incident, but evolution from year to year as to how much these are growing, how more widespread they're becoming. Another area um, from a, a global perspective standpoint is sea level rise. Uh, using satellites, we've measured sea level rise um, reliably since the early 1990s and what you see here is the spatial distribution of sea level rise so we can estimate global rise but also how it varies from location to location which is dependent on you know where the energy is being absorbed in the ocean where the water and ice that are causing the seas to rise in addition to thermal expansion are coming in from and the satellite perspective by orbiting the Earth repeatedly over and over and over for decades um, tells us the regional characteristics, which makes a huge difference in the implications for coastal regions. A, a few inches, um, a difference of a few inches has tremendous implications for people worldwide. And then this last example is really a great illustration of interaction between components of the Earth's system. Uh, this is the carbon dioxide uptake from vegetation and what you see is CO2, carbon dioxide, overlaid on uh, the annual vegetation patterns. And you can see as spring arrives in the northern hemisphere, we can watch the CO2 uptake by the vegetation in the northern hemisphere. And as fall comes, we watch the increase in CO2 as there is less vegetation to to take up that carbon dioxide. So the space-based perspective has already told us much, but it's got a lot to tell us going forward. Now ultimately, the solutions to the climate change challenge is going to depend on policy and sound decision-making, uh, the choices we make as a society. Um, 
And those policies and those choices need data to be made in an informed way. And that, again, is what the space-based perspective tells us. Um, so what can these observations do in the future? Well, one, we can continue watching the climate change story unfold, whether it be uh, manifested through rising oceans, increased fire, changes in hurricane behavior, um, you know, just plain warming, uh, the implications for vegetation, whatever. The space-based perspective allows us to look at the global scale and understand how that story is unfolding. We can also, through new investments, make new kinds of observations that can help us get at the root of these changes, but also inform the implications of our choices uh, so that we can make our choices better um, or provide information on the implications of our choices. These data improve models. When we observe and understand, we get better at predicting so taking these data and understanding the processes at work and improving our models accordingly allows us to better predict the future, better understand what we're in for and better prepare for what's coming and better mitigate the changes that, that will happen. So ultimately, this information through the direct observations or how we inform our models will inform policy, will inform our choices. And the good news is we've got the technology, we've got the scientific expertise and capability. What we need is the investment. And we've been lucky that there have been robust investments uh, for quite some time. But when compared to the implications of the climate change challenge and the costs associated with it, those investments have been comparatively small. Uh, so with increased investments, we'll be able to do more. We'll be able to better position ourselves to meet the challenges that are undoubtedly coming. And I'm going to leave you with a quote, a pretty powerful one in my view, uh, by Socrates from 400 BC. Even then he knew, man must rise above the earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond, for only thus will he fully understand the world in which he lives. It was true then, it was true today, and it'll be true tomorrow. So thank you for your attention, and thank you to the organizers for putting this session together, and to the other members of this session uh, contributing on the panel. I appreciate being a part of it. Well, that certainly got us off to a good start. Uh, I think it comes as no surprise to anyone that space technologies can contribute significantly to global efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change, and that indeed these technologies have already been instrumental in helping scientists gain a better picture of the urgency of climate change. But what we're here to discuss today is the knowledge and the technology gaps. What's needed? What's next? Um, in terms of new technologies, in terms of how we process and manage current data to ensure that humanity has a full understanding of the problem and is able to take informed action. To try to answer those questions, I will turn to my panel. Um, while that's up, just a quick reminder that we do have a poll on Mentimeter, so please follow the link just below your streaming feed to participate. I am incredibly honored to introduce this panel. Uh, it's not often that I get starstruck, but we have a really incredible lineup for you today. To start with, Marion Diop Kane is a metrologist with long experience in forecasting and research into the African monsoon and weather systems. Following a period as the Director of Meteorology at the National Agency for Civil Aviation and Meteorology of Senegal, she is currently a program manager at the WMO Africa Regional Office in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Lori Garver is CEO of Earthrise Alliance, a philanthropic initiative established to fully utilize earth science data to combat climate change. In her illustrious career, she was also the deputy administrator of NASA and the executive director at the National Space Society, among many other roles. Steve Homburg is chief scientist at the Environmental Defense Fund. He has served as the lead author for the Inter uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the UN and was recognized as one of the scientists contributing to the award of the 20, uh, 20, 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Finally, we have Thelma Krug, who is the former Deputy National Secure Secretary at the Secretary of Policies and Programs of Science Technology at the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation and Communication in Brazil. And in 2015, she was elected vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Welcome to my panel. 
Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Great. So you are all live. Good morning. Good morning. So you're all live now. I'm actually going to start with Ms. Crook. Um, the IPCC is currently undertaking the sixth assessment report on science related to climate change. I'd like you to start by telling us what role does Earth observation play in this process? And in your opinion, what has changed since the last assessment report? Okay, thank you very much, Christo. And before I start, let me also congratulate the winners of the context. We really need all uh, stimulating young people, you know, to get interested in this subject. Uh, also, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And I think that uh, uh, Willie has really set up the scene uh, for this discussion here. He said uh, that we already have a lot of remotely sensed data, uh, but this can do more. Satellite information can do more. And uh, we see this increasingly with the IPCC assessment reports. So if I can give just a little bit of the background, the IPCC uh, does not do the research itself. It relies on the assessment of a broad range of literature that is relevant for, the, uh, for, for, for climate change, including the physical basis of climate change, impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, and mitigation of climate change. So we have these three big working groups in the IPCC that work in the assessment of the literature worldwide. And this is why it's so important that we have you know, publications, scientific uh, publications, information from the social economics uh, and te uh, technological also information. So if we look, uh, the increasingly uh, IPCC has been more than 30 years doing these assessments. We are in the sixth cycle now. So if we go back and see how it improves and how much it relies or remotely sensed data, not only to improve the model capacity to project future climate change, but also on many of the relevant uh, points that uh, we lead has put forward, uh, including uh, uh, the shrinking of the sea ice cover, uh, the fires in terms of uh, uh, their intensity, their frequency. We know that you know climate change projects uh, with climate change uh, uh, increasing, uh, we project more uh, uh, fires, uh, greater intensity, and so on. And remotely sensed data is a is a uh, incredible tool that we can use to uh, look at this and look at shifts in the trend of uh, of the observations. Okay, but to respond to your question objectively, uh, uh, I will. I I I think that I. I sought to consult working group one that works on the physical basis of climate change. And why is that? It's because their assessment report is coming up for approval of the 195 governments now in July and August. So we are going to have uh, new information coming up. And from the point of view of, uh, of uh, remotely sensed data, um, Working group one selected five points where they see improvements. So I'm gonna just you know highlight those points very quickly. One is the improved understanding of the drivers and their role in the Earth's energy imbalance. So we know that, for instance, uh, some publications that just uh, both satellite and in situ observations independently show an approximate doubling of this unbalance from mid-2005 to mid-2019. So it's just this imbalance in the incoming flux to the outgoing one. The second one is the closure of the Earth's energy budget through atmosphere, ice, ocean, land monitoring. So remotely sensed information uh, is really important when we look at this energy budget because we want to include information from the atmosphere, aerosols, greenhouse gases, uh, surface albedo, clouds, vegetation, land use patterns. So remotely sensed data has a huge contribution for us to assess these. The third one is on the closure of the sea level budget, and uh, uh, which aims to reduce the current uncertainties on uh, sea level change 
and the individual components for this change. Uh, so when we reduce uncertainties of sea level change, it improves our understanding of the processes involved in causing this global mean sea level rise and the regional variability. So this is the third one when we talk about closure uh, of both the uh, energy budget and sea level budget, we mean to reduce uncertainties. And throughout the assessments of the IPCC, you see this very clearly. So one of, uh, of the real uh, challenges we have is to really improve our ability uh, to project the future and see the changes and, uh, and remotely sensed uh, data is, is there. Uh, the fourth issue is also narrowing the range of equilibrium climate sensitivity, including through improved observation constraints on feedbacks. Uh, and we see, for instance, that in, uh, in AR4 of 2007, we did have this range of equilibrium climate sensitivity using a model which was the CMIP3, changed in the yeah. assessment of 2014 using another model based on another uh, characteristics. And now in AR6, we are going to even have an improved modeling approach, uh, which will help us to, to narrow the range of equilibrium in climate sensitivity. And finally, the last one uh, is the growing field of constraining climate projections. Uh, we are talking about this new, uh, this new area of emergent constraints uh, that is coming up, um, combining these emerging uh, constraints uh, and relating them with observations that could reduce uncertainty surrounding future climate. Um, on the last two points that were made uh, by working group one, and I think that this is very general, I think that the points I made were very technical in nature, but two uh, important issues they highlighted. One is the importance of remotely sensed data for the quality of reanalysis and the challenges that are linked to the continuity and also homogeneity of the measurements for doing that. Mm -hmm. So we see that remotely sensed data need to ensure this continuity so that we can do reanalysis, looking you know, from past uh, information and observations, but we need to have continuity of this. So uh, uh, we see that uh, the need for the programs to have continuity and consistency. The uh, so second point- so um, I want to come back to that point. So I yes. think what we'll do, I'm going to go to the next question, but I'd like to come back to this idea of the quality yeah. of data, because I think that's really going to be key for our audience to understand that challenge. Okay, that's perfect. First, right. it, it, just a, a small point, Crystal, and it's also the regional information. You know, it's, it's really the importance of having this really, really going from the broad to the smaller scale. So those are the two points that the working group on yeah, finally made. Thank you. That's actually the perfect segue into our next speaker, um, Ms. Kane. I wanted to ask you about climate services for adaptation and how they're generated through the global framework for climate services and specifically about that situation in Africa. What are the unique challenges that you face there? Uh, thank you, Crystal. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Do you hear me? My internet is going on and off. I hope You're you can hear me. Good. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, panel. Climate change is definitely inevitable. We are already in it with climate variability and increase of extreme events, both in frequency and intensity. All parties are working to keep to the Paris Agreement and keep the temperature change down to 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. Meanwhile, we need to adapt and move to climate resilient, climate smart activities to get the best out of it and minimize the impact on societies and economies. So climate services can help, surely. They are essential tools for adaptation to climate change. And many reports, as you may know, have shown that uh, the invest investing in climate services uh, has many benefits. Uh, it's been rated 
to one out of four. So climate services are really essential for climate adaptation. So following the third world climate conference, the GFCS was established with a three-tier organization at global level, regional, and national level. And climate services are realized through a value chain from operational hydrometeorological systems, including the observation networks, data and databases, climate monitoring and forecasting products, and provision and delivery of services, and all through partnership, research and innovation and development, as well as user interface platform. WOMO, Global Producing Centers, will feed information into the regional climate centers, which in turn process regional products to be used and adapted by national meteorological and hydrological services to meet their users' needs. National meteorological and hydrological services develop tailored product through a user interface platform, as I just said, and through collaborative research, both at national level and international level, and partnership to support planning and decision-making in climate-sensitive sectors, such as agriculture and food security, water resources management, health, energy, disaster risk reduction to achieve improved climate-related outcomes and generate socioeconomic benefit. One example of climate services is the seasonal forecast produced during the Regional Climate Outlook Forums, the ARCOFs, and these have been established over 30, 20 years now and have a nearly global coverage. And at the end, organize their national climate outlook forum, where they define, refine the forecast at national level and update it throughout the rainy season. And the tendency of the rainy season is then well known, well in advance, as well as perspective for food security or insecurity. And this is very important for Africa, which is highly dependent Challenges in Africa are many, but the main one I would say is for data and infrastructure, as well as expertise. But for expertise, well, we have a growing number of experts, but the issue is to have a critical mass of experts being retained at national level and develop those climate services. For the data and infrastructure, we've been having a steady decrease of the observation data. And this is not a significant, significant I think and climate projections. Thank you, Marianne. I think we're losing you a little bit. So hopefully that's that Marianne. I think we're losing you a little bit. So I'm gonna move on to our next question and swing back to you because uh, you were just getting into the challenges and I'd like to hear more about that. Uh, my next question is for Lori. Your organization works to convert earth data systems into relevant and actionable knowledge to combat climate change. Can you talk to us about how the different audiences ranging from the general public to policymakers um, to scientists, what are the different needs when it comes to understanding the climate change data that is generated by earth observation satellites? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, Earthrise, when we began just a few years ago, looked into the data that was available and determined that the biggest gap really was in connecting the unbelievable amounts of data we have to users. And those users can range, of course, from the public all the way to policymakers and a number of uh, parties in between for uses that are perhaps unlimited uh, based on the fact that as Waleed, I think, well outlined in his earlier talk, the unique perspective of space offers us something that we cannot get otherwise. I, we always 
I, I named it Earthrise because, of course, connecting space to the Earth, that Earthrise photo that was taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts was the first look back we had in the mirror that really captured the public's attention. But I also sort of capitalized RISE because I worked at NASA, so you have to have acronyms, and RISE is a renaissance in sensing the environment. We have not only the new developments in sensor technologies and satellites, lower costs of launches and satellites, and all the new ways we have of storing and accessing data and modeling techniques. So we have had, I, I fully agree with this morning's premise, um, so much value to the climate change discussion we wouldn't even know about without our uh, satellite constellations. But it's time for us to really figure out how to best utilize that data between resilience, uh, things we can do to mitigate and things that we can do to adapt. So for the public, uh, we at Earthrise primarily work through journalists to tell stories. You know, no matter, no matter what, it's a local story and the public around the planet needs to see and can see now from space what is changing in their own backyard. And I think Earthrise making that connection by seeding stories around the world to journalists who can then utilize the data within um, what is happening in their neck of the woods. So we utilize all the free government satellite data, but also have agreements with the private sector providers like Maxar and Planet and Airbus. So being able to add value added um, analysis and show the public what mm -hmm. is happening so they can recognize and take action uh, to prevent it is one aspect of this. We also reach students through teachers and allow them to access the data because again, there is so much wonderful data out there from space and they can build on their own tablets or phones, a story that shows in their own backyard, how climate has affected their own environment. Um, Ultimately leading to policymakers, I think the major issue for policymakers is having people beyond sort of the agencies that create the data, like, like NASA, really recognize how they can utilize it and to be able to share that information. If we are to do what I think most people agree uh, would be necessary to really address climate change, we have to be able to measure it more precisely, emissions in particular. And if we can do that, both with, I think, all the greenhouse gases, but uh, we're starting to do that with, with methane and certainly with CO2, that you can have a monetization scheme that is built on something that is verifiable. So this would also work for trade agreements. And I think policy can be set if it, it's, it's somewhat of a chicken or an egg, I always thought, well, let's set the policies and certainly the private sector will come along if the government's gonna buy that data um, to be able to fulfill the needs. But it is also now a push and a pull because right now we have organizations developing data that will inform policymakers so it can drive policy. Uh, so the technology is an, just an amazing, um, renaissance where we are able to utilize more of the data but we don't utilize it in a way that as i think every single speaker has said already is um as meaningful as it can be so if you are looking to as an insurance uh company you probably have found a way to get that information you know if you're if there's a way to make money Say that more and more people will do that. But in a policy sense, we really, um, I think, can do a better job, and at least uh, this administration is working to do that. I will note that we often, one of the gaps, I think, in the policy world is we, NASA, for instance, think, well, we measure the um, climate, but we're not the ones who set policy to do anything about it. 
And then, you know, NOAA is an operational agency and they are there to convey what's happening more on the operational side. And the hole in this, the gap, is who is going to analyze that data in order to influence policy. And I would go back to uh, the 80s where we had the determination by not just NASA, but other agencies of the ozone hole. But NASA scientists did help contribute to the ultimate recognition and solution. So recognizing that CFCs were contributing to the deterioration of the ozone hole led to them being banned through policy. And that's the feedback loop that we are trying to incentivize by people um, seeing that this data isn't just for science. There, there should be things that connect that data to actions that make a meaningful change. And that's what we're all about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Laura, you had on two points. One, you gave me a great lead in to, uh, to Steve, uh, just an organization that is actually seeking to do exactly what you're saying, which is address a very specific need within the community. But before I turn to him, I, I absolutely agree with you that, that I think sometimes we make the mistake when you're a geek and when you're a scientist, you know, build it and they will come. We're excited about the data. It shows us so much. And there's an absolute truth in that. But you really hit on the point that it's about building a chain of information. And it, it builds on what Marianne was saying about that turning this into climate services, turning this into the ability to make decisions, and then motivating people to do so. Because I think as we all unfortunately know, just because we know something doesn't mean something happens next. Um, and so having the data is incredibly important, but then building out um, information and attitudes and services and, and, and interpretation, all of those things matter just as much. I, I think that was really um, a great overview. Steve, I'd like to turn to you next. Uh, you are engaged in some exciting new work uh, by a non-governmental and non-commercial organization. Essentially, as I understand it, custom designing a satellite to provide much needed climate data. In fact, uh, just recently, Governor Newsom of California uh, set up another related project that these homegrown satellites are a game changer. So I'd like for you to tell us um, about how that came to be and especially what other possibilities you see in the future in this particular area. Thanks so much, Crystal, and uh, thanks for the great talks, and it's great to be here with these uh, distinguished colleagues. Um, so I think um, Lori set it up wonderfully. Um, I describe it as we're trying to build the data to action pipeline. So what we need to do is not only have that intact pipe, but also fill it with high quality data. So Methane Sat is a satellite uh, being built by Methane Sat LLC, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Environmental Defense Fund, a nonprofit. And what we're trying to do is to produce high quality, actionable data and fill the gaps that Lori described so that we can actually provide free of charge across the globe, uh, highly resolved, spatially resolved and fully quantified methane emissions data from the oil and gas industry, as well as hopefully agriculture, which we're still working on. The satellite will launch in 2022, late 2022. And it really, I think, is a game changer in really trying to think through, in a way, the reverse order. While um, Thelma talked about critically important scientists as, on an, as a scientist who's worked on climate change for many decades on the ground, and Marianne talked about adaptation, another essential piece. Um, and Lori talked about how to build the civil society action. What we, what we need, though, is increasing quantities of actionable data. And we have to start with what data do we need and then work backwards to what technology will be required. And that's exactly what we did in the methane sac case. We didn't start with the technology. We started with what data is missing. And we started by using on the ground data collected intensively in the United States to say, what do we need to understand in order to map and quantify methane emissions from oil and gas industry? And why, why look at oil and gas? Because it represents a significant source of methane. And most people don't even under, recognize that methane accounts for a quarter, more than a quarter of the warming we're experiencing today. And because it's a short-lived climate pollutant, roughly half of the warming we'll experience from emissions that our uh, climate emissions from this year will be the result over the next 20 years. So excuse me, let me make that clear. So the impact of this year's greenhouse gas emissions over the next 20 years will be dominated by methane emissions. 
CO2 is a critically important greenhouse gas, which we have to reduce because that determines the long-term warming. But in the near term, if we want to slow the rate of warming, which is creating so much of the damages, we've got to reduce methane emissions. And oil and gas industry has demonstrated they have the technology and the ability to reduce those emissions. The IEA has shown that 75% of emissions are uh, can be reduced with existing technology and roughly half of the emissions can be reduced at no net cost. So we have a great opportunity, but we don't have enough data. So we started with what specific data do we need? And then we went and said, can we measure it from space? Because ultimately, as everyone said, we need to do this across the globe and the best place to do it is from space. That resulted in a partnership between a range of different groups in academia, former government employees, the government in New Zealand, as well as the commercial space industry. And we brought all of this expertise together to develop this capacity in relatively rapid time to create the most highly, uh, highly effective satellite. So it's the most precise satellite currently being built or planned to measure methane emissions uh, from space. This will give us an unprecedented ability to see but in addition to the data, we have to have the software that allows us to quantify those emissions. Generally, we see data on concentrations. Those don't easily correlate with quantification. So we are developing a fully automated uh, inversion technique for the first time that allows us to map in near real time the total emissions. We believe that building these kinds of pipelines through collaborations across civil society with government, with private sector, as well as with academics and NGOs will allow us to greatly accelerate what we know, which will allow us to take action much more rapidly. We believe that is really a game changer. We think that we can make rapid progress by using this combination. And Lori spelled it out wonderfully of showing how Traditionally, we have siloed approaches, different agencies or groups responsible for individual segments of the problem. We really need to bring all of that together, create a pipeline and fill it with high quality data and give policymakers and civil society the data they need to take the action that's required to reduce the rate of warming over the near term and the long term. And only with that kind of dramatic action are we likely to be able to put off the most dramatic impacts of climate change, which we all fear. It, it's a big, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. And we, we know that. And so one thing I wanted to actually do was take a look at this word cloud that we put is our first poll. So we actually asked our audience to weigh in on sort of what is the first type of benefit they think of regarding satellites and climate change. And one of the most interesting things that I see in this, I know some of it's a little small uh, for everybody to read, but some of the biggest words that got put in the most actually don't relate to super specific technology. They relate to the actions that you all have been discussing, observing, knowledge, measuring, monitoring, having a global view, having perspective. Um, so I'd like to get all of your thoughts in terms of We've identified, I think, as a group, some of the important needs. But one of the things that I'd like to ask is, is about resources. So in his initial remarks, Waleed specifically brought up resources. And I wanted to ask you all, all of you to weigh in on any thoughts you have. Is the problem here money? Is this that we need more resources put to this problem? Or do you think that it's a lot more complex than that? So maybe, Lori, I'll start with you, and then anyone else who's interested can chime in. But I'd like your thoughts on, you know, do we have enough resources to enact what you all are just describing? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And resources can mean a lot of things. And I would never say we don't need more resources. <laughs> uh, I believe we could effectively double NASA's budget and utilize it very well. But it's an and not a just do that. That wouldn't solve much, honestly. It is, it, you know, as, as we we're discussing, as Steve just said as well, a combination of users in the government and the private sector, nonprofits, as well as global organizations. So as, as we're here, I'd love to hear from the IPCC, what do they really need? We have models, we have um, gaps because of data. We have gaps because people don't know about utilization. We have 
gaps that are still types um, in, a, along pretty much every point. And I have found that both the government and the private sector want to do the right thing, but they don't talk to each other well or interact well. And I think the government really does want to do a, a better job, but the government doesn't speak with one voice and has a lot of priorities. So even the great emphasis we have in the Biden administration on addressing climate change, NASA wasn't even within the first uh, dozen agencies they thought of to be on their, their climate um, policy team. So we really have a lot of work to do and we can always use resources and money and other ways. Thank you. Um, I'll just kick it over to, to Thelma and, and Lori has a great point and then we'll go to Steve and Marianne. But, you know, what's your perspective on this at the IPCC? Thelma? Yeah, obviously, I think I mentioned briefly uh, in my intervention that at every assessment that comes every six years, uh, so it's voluntary work of thousands of, I uh, would say hundreds of, uh, of authors coming from all over the world. Uh, and obviously, as I said, uh, uh, assessing models and using these models to improve or to reduce the uncertainty. So this is the real benefit that we have from one assessment to the other. It's not that we go wrong in one assessment. We can do better in the next because you are improving the accuracy of your, your models. You are inputting more data into the models to make them uh, every time more, more reliable. Uh, so, uh, I think that from the uh, point of view of the, the IPCC, obviously we rely a lot on the modeling community and the modeling community to rely on better and better data. So, I see that, you know, when we talk about the issue of the resources, obviously, as Laurie has said, the resources is always an issue, right? And But this is why we see a lot of partnerships. Also, I think, uh, Laurie, if you allow me, uh, I, I, there, you know, I have been in the remote sensing uh, space agency for a long time and now retired. But uh, at the beginning, 1982, the data was paid, uh, was Landsat data, not so many data available. Uh, and now through time, you see more and more data becoming available for people to use. And why do we say the importance of that is really so that everyone is equity everyone could have a chance of getting the data, extracting information from that data to, as many have said, to inform policymakers for action. I don't know of a better example uh, than the monitoring of the Brazilian Amazonia for the deforestation. And they, you know, maintaining the consistency, that's what is important, the consistency mm -hmm. of the data availability that allows us to every single year, wall to wall, to inform the government. Now, uh, well, if that uh, triggers action, <laughs> at least the information is there. So from the point of view of the IPCC, that's what matters. Science is there, we inform, data is there. Now action, action should come from uh, every single government. And that's what we are expecting. Uh, in, uh, from all governments in climate change. So it's really uh, a, a, an important issue here. Resources, availability, free access to data. And uh, it's not only me saying that, a lot of communities saying the importance of free accessible data to extract information, to inform policymakers. Then it's up to them how to manage that. I can't hear you. Yeah, I agree, Thelma. I sit on the program board of the Group on Earth Observation that focuses on exactly this. And so sometimes it's not just about putting more money into new data, it's yeah. about how much we have access to and what we can do with that. And is there enough resources to access the data that is available? Steve, I'd like to get your thoughts on this topic. Yeah, well, I think uh, Thelma, uh, pointed out to two key things. So obviously open access data is critically important. And while private sector is important, it doesn't replace that open access data. And the second one is policy relevant data. And the example in the in the Amazon is, is, fa is a fabulous one. But the, regrettably, much of the data that's collected is not policy relevant. 
and there's no mandate to make it policy relevant. So we really need to ensure that the funds that we do have lead to the full filling of that pipeline and not just um, data for data sake. And while that is harsh, I can say that I was an academic for most of my career. I've been doing academic research for longer, uh, for a long time, for many decades. And I think we need a mandate to say that all of the data needs to lead there. That's not to say that basic research isn't important, but we haven't uh, filled the gap and given that mandate to uh, public spending. And we have to recognize as we're doing with methane sat that philanthropic uh, investments is also critically important. We're able to make all the data for methane sat uh, publicly available and to do all of this work in short time uh, by using philanthropic uh, funding. Uh, with, so that's, we're taking no corporate funding and uh, we do have government funding from the New Zealand. Great. So Marion, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. As someone who is focused on climate services in Africa, what are your resource needs? What are, where are the areas where you think there is more need for funding or other you know, resources? Marianne? Oh, I barely hear you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was breaking up, but I was going to come up to resources before my uh, internet breaks up. I think that resources are very important. It depends just on where you are sitting in the world. In Africa, is having uh, access to, um, to the data, and I would even add infrastructure is capital. And I say that um, it is even the main challenge, and I would put it under the budget constraint of the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services, uh, which we're having very limited uh, really resources. So it's important, and it is even well highlighted in the um, African Ministerial Conference on Meteorology, which is working very hard with African Union Commission to increase the political support to national med services and ensure that uh, climate services are adequately delivered. And in this delivery, I think that all of the value chain of the um, uh, climate services needs to be strengthened. So data, uh, access to data, being aware to the data, getting the infrastructure to process those data are really key for Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. That actually takes us to some of our audience questions, which are starting to roll in. So a reminder to everyone, if you'd like to ask this panel or any of our panels, uh, you can click on the link at the bottom of the live stream. I'm excited. Uh, I think one of the first questions that has already gotten some upvotes in our voting uh, people from the audience is related to exactly what Marianne was just talking about. So I'd like to see if anyone else has any comments on it. So starting with this question, do policymakers know how important satellites are for tackling climate change? And if not, what can we do to improve that awareness? And I'd like to add, you know, I think this is a great question because I think to a certain extent the answer is yes, but not entirely. And so all of you have interacted with governments in different ways. You know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what we can do to improve the understanding among non-scientist policymakers that this data and these ops, you know, this, this information is there. Um, so, Thelma, I saw you nodding. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, exactly as you say. Uh, they all know, but not everything. So, all the very technical issues that I put forward from Working Group 1, most likely, you know, the governments do not know into depth, you know, the implications of these measurements and these models and so on. Uh, what do the governments know more readily? They, when they, they, they more readily know about land use change. So that's my assessment because of inventories, because of submissions to the ANFCCC, like, you know, forest changes, like degradation, deforestation. Uh, so, so, uh, so they are more interested or know more about the importance of remote sensing to assess these changes in land use and the implications of that. So I would say that that is the number one for governments, I would say. And then, you know, others will build up their knowledge uh, depending on how is their surrounding in terms of uh, technical people, uh, making them knowledgeable of the increases in CO2, in CH4, as Steve has said. I don't think that many governments know about the CH4, Steve, uh, you know, although we do have satellites already that measure that. But I think that one of the implications, and just uh, Crystal, just 
uh, to finalize is really, you know, uh, remotely sensed data cannot separate the implications from anthropogenic, uh, uh, anthropogenic actions in natural variability. So many governments put that, you know, in front, saying, well, maybe this is not really, you know, because of anthropogenic uh, actions or measures, but they come from natural variability. That, for instance, is the case for fires. Uh, and uh, just to give one example, so let me uh, jump in because, yes, uh, Selma, uh, I think is right, though I, I'm going to suggest that, in fact, what we need to do is ask the policymakers what data they need to create effective policy and then make sure we have it. Because in most cases, we do not have the data that that's why I call it policy relevant data. Not at all, some. And where I would maybe disagree a little with Thelma is that I think uh, we do have the capacity for many types of sources of greenhouse gases to separate anthropogenic from uh, uh, human caused uh, from natural uh, emissions. Now there are some tough places, absolutely, where they're mingled makes it very hard. Um, but we can do a lot better than we have by building instruments to provide the data needed by the policymakers with a deliberate mind to that and not the science. And as a scientist, I did all most of my career thinking about what do I need for science? Very important. We need to turn that around. What do we need to help humanity address the problems and build the tools to give that data in addition? We have done a terrible job, I would argue, at that. And I think that what we can do, certainly what we found in methane is the tools were out there and were not being deployed. And we needed to start the, again, we need to run the from the pipeline the opposite way. What do we need for policymakers? Then back up to the data and the technology. And I think what we'll do is we'll see a rapid acceleration in the usefulness, the recognition of the power of remote sensing uh, in just a few years. We have all the tools. We just need to put them together and create a new generation of satellites that are much more policy relevant. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And it, it's impossible to separate out scientists doing things for science and then the incredible need that we have as a society right now. And it, it's always going to be both that this is one area where changing our frame or at least adding that frame of trying to think of it from the other direction is really key, uh, particularly when it comes to making useful data. Lori, did you want to chime in on this one? Only to emphasize the point. I could not agree more and you know NASA has science and applications but the applications parts oh really tiny and really not starting with the end state user in mind well the end state user is and has been that researcher to uh what steve used to be and we need to transition to um policy outside of just the you know domain of uh, studying Earth as a system, and in addition to doing that, be able to identify users so we can develop to their needs. It's not something NASA likes to do. I guess I would ask Steve if this, even for me, 10 years ago, I was frustrated at NASA's insistence on sticking with the exact decadal plan for earth sciences and it would take 30 years to fly it all out with these big missions that were not based on any of the applications that were current and in talking to barry and Moore, who at the time had led the earth science decadal report and now while we followed with the next decadal report they both acknowledged that things in earth sciences change faster mm -hmm. so that the investments probably can't be decided that that far in advance. Those work for astronomy, for instance. Um, Steve, do you think that is a is something we could do differently? A absolutely. <laughs> and again, it's an and, right? So I am not in any way pushing back against science. I, I, that would be against my <laughs> my whole training and background None of most of my career. <laughs> right. But but we need to exactly be nimble. And that's where I, I have to accredit the folks that we brought in from commercial space. They knew how to be nimble in a way, but that wasn't sufficient. We also needed the best leading academics, which we brought in. We have two great institutions in Harvard and the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory as key partners. It was bringing all of that together. Historically, we've not brought all those sectors together, the policymakers. 
So on our team, we have a whole series of people who do nothing but interact with the policymakers so we can get that, that input, right? What do they need? What does the finance community need? What do all these different communities need? We need to have that voice there and not just, you know, I, I've worked with Barry in over many years, you know, a lot of great scientists, but that's, you need other types of voices when we do these reviews and they can't be decadal or multi-decadal. They have to be both long-term and near-term. And that just like the climate problem, we have a near-term problem and a long-term problem and it's a big and we got to solve both. That's a great point. It is all about implementing effectively the uh, global climate uh, framework services. Uh, as I said in, uh, in the beginning, uh, it's defining uh, who needs the data, what for, policymakers, users, and that can be done through a user interface platform. So implementing the global climate services is at national level or regional level is a key point. Absolutely. I'd like to, um, I, I, this is such a fascinating topic, but I also want to give our audience a chance to ask more questions. And I, I think the next one, is really interesting. So the question is, in the past few years, young climate activists have made global headlines. What can young space professionals do, or any space professional for that matter, do to boost the utilization of space systems for climate change and action? And so I think a way of rewording this is, we've been talking about all these different end users. This is a really interesting group. Does anyone have any thoughts on, as a public, you know, what about th these young people who are really pushing for action, in some cases, making a lot of progress. You know, is there a way that we can try to connect space data to them? I have a concept that um, I put out uh, in a couple of ways that I'll just outline quickly, which is a climate data core or uh, um, something like Biden has proposed. And I think he's having both the interior department and the agriculture department lead it. But I think NASA, NOAA, USGS could play a role because young people need to be well versed in reading satellite data and interpreting it and if you put people into training who do this or have people coming out of academia who have this ability they can go into local communities across the united states but hopefully the world more like peace corps to work with the decision makers on the local level we understand the impacts of this are local um, at least for adaptation um, and resilience. And to me, there are so many people coming, my, my kids are in their 20s, who this is, should and is their number one priority, and they would sign up to do some kind of service for, um, and space needs to play a role. Our data can be utilized better if we put people out who are trained, who can connect that information to people who do need it. Yeah, Steve, do you have any thoughts on this? You work at a, a university, you work with the university as part of your project. I'm just curious if it's something you all have considered. Yeah, so certainly we try and, and there is a, a lot of uh, younger folk part of our project uh, through universities. But I think also, uh, you know, satellites bring one set of data. They're not the only source of data. And there's a lot of on ground truthing. There's a lot of uh, remote sensing, uh, more uh, uh, you know, visible spectrum uh, mapping, because one of the key things is you need to be able to understand what is where on a global basis. We don't have those kind of global maps. So I think there's, uh, to Lori's point, um, uh, just a whole host of ways to interact. What we have to do is also be realistic. Uh, and you know, there's some of this is highly technical and requires a fairly sophisticated math. And there are fabulous young people who can do it, but it isn't something that the average 18 year old or even the average 25 year old can do. So we need to basically create a, a, a menu of options for people to get involved. I think they exist there. There are lots and lots of organizations utilizing a range of citizen science as well as advanced uh, computing. And we see it in the data science world where we have all kinds of competitions um, that, that take advantage of a younger generation's commitment. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you're right that it's, it's not everything, right? But there's an opportunity for visualization here and outreach that doesn't fit into our usual paradigm mm -hmm. of governments and you know scientists. And so trying to think of what we turn data into in certain circumstances for that outreach, I think has a real, real possibility there. I'd like to move on to one more audience question. I think I'll have uh, Marianne maybe take this one first. Um, so we've talked a lot about satellite data here, uh, but that's not the only data source. So this person was asking, is there a need for the space community to develop more interactions with other sources of climate data? So Thelma or Marianne, I'd love to hear from you on this one. Uh, sure. I think that we need to mix up these uh, long series of satellite data with in situ data and any other data that uh, can allow the computation of climate records to study climate change. I can give the example of Copernicus Climate Change Service, which is very useful, but the African users need to be aware of those uh, data to be able to develop their capacity to access them, use them, and process them for their own needs. Uh, UMATSAT, I think, have been organizing lots of series of webinars, but there are other satellite providers whose data can be of interest, and uh, uh, the African community need to be aware of that. So we need to really do uh, some awareness campaign so that uh, those youngsters and other users have access to them. And what is very good and very promising is that uh, many satellite operators are working together so the coordination group of the meteorological satellite, CGMS, and the committee of Earth Observation Satellite, COS, working group on climate monitoring to produce uh, good climate data records without gaps. So I'm very excited about the new generation of satellites that are coming, as they will offer tremendous atmospheric and atmospheric composition data, as well as surface, ocean data with a much better spatial and temporal resolution. And I think that this will, in the long run, offer better climate data records with a much higher resolution that will enable better knowledge of local climate change and local adaptation. Thank you. Thelma, what do you think about how the space community interacts with other data sources? Well, uh, it's essential. <laughs> I would say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you take, for instance, remotely sensed data uh, to, uh, as an example, to assess land use change, right? And then you would need some uh, data, infield, ground data, to validate your satellite data. That's essential. Uh, depending on the classifier that you're going to use to extract the information, it has to be trained to do that. And training means that you would input data that you have collected elsewhere. So a uh, few data is essential here, uh, I-score data. So we are talking about a whole set of other uh, data sets that really feed into the system. It was really interesting because when we didn't have, for instance, uh, satellite data uh, to look at the concentration of CO2 versus all other gases, and, and when they came up to, 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 you know, into reality, you see how much they fit into previous observations. So that gives uh, a much more, uh, let's say, confidence to, to governments that you are putting together a whole set of data coming from different and independent sources that uh, obviously add to the reliability of what you're talking about. Uh, so it's essential, I would say. It's essential to have Let me, diverse um, sets. Okay. Yeah, I just want to emphasize that. I mean, I think there's some wonderful programs like IGUS at WMO, so I'll plug Mary Ann's wonderful institution, uh, as well as now at UNEP, starting the International Methane Emissions Observatory, which is trying to link all these data, bring them together in a way that allows us to create, because they give you very different perspectives. Totally agree with Thelma. It's absolutely critical for validation. Um, you need this kind of data, but there are uh, on the methane front, there are hundreds and hundreds of scientists, literally many, many hundreds collecting field data that absolutely creates a, a granularity that we'll, we're well away from being able to ever produce with uh, remote sensing. And so they're complementary, 
They also provide uh, the capacity building around the globe as, as these studies occur in, in a diversity of nations where you have good science, but maybe hadn't worked on it. And that's really that combination that gives us the confidence against uh, Thelma's point. And there are institutions that are working across these different scales and we need to support those. Absolutely. So I'll be honest, I could continue this conversation forever. We have more great questions um, coming in from the audience, uh, but we have to end on time. So I want to close with one opportunity for sort of one final comment here and, and maybe kind of give 30 second to a minute answers to just say, you know, this isn't a new problem. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really excited about everything we've talked about. I, I think the opportunities are amazing. But you know, there's also a concern that we're not taking action fast enough, and that you know, as we talked about with young people, they're very concerned for very good reason. Uh, you know, we have the focus on the you know the UN sustainable uh, sustainable development goals and whether we're going to to reach those in this area. And so, I'd like to close with just an opportunity for you to say, you know, 30 seconds of what do you think the most important form of action that we could take in this area? in say the next 10 years, or if you could sort of tell governments or academia or the commercial industry one thing that you think that they should do, you know, what would that be? Um, Steve, I might start with you because I, I, I suspect I might know the answer, but I'm curious what you have to say and then we'll just go around uh, the panel. Yeah, so, well, as I mentioned, we need to reduce methane emissions dramatically. It can slow the rate of warming uh, incredibly uh, quickly, uh, which will reduce damages. But, and, and related to that is, I think we need, as the satellite community needs to think about, as I said before, what data does the policy community need? And we have to ask them. And then we have to go out and produce them in the next few years so that a decade from now, we have a, a picture of what's happening that we've never had before. And uh, I think that's a game changer. Absolutely. Laurie, what about you? I think the greatest gap is in leadership. To me, it does take people around the world in senior positions who show real leadership and stand up to and recognize what we now know is happening, how we can get even more of that information and make decisions that um, will be impactful from that data. In the US, I, I believe that NASA could take a much larger role. I think NASA was formed to address what the U.S. at the time envisioned as a global crisis, and they stepped up to it, and they could do more now. But there needs to be greater coordination in the U.S. government for managing the data as part of the greater issue. Great. Thank you. Thelma, what about you? If you, if you were okay. for a day, what would you tell everyone to do? I'm going to uh, I'm going to do bullet wise. <laughs> so Laurie was right when she said we need leadership and also we need to recognize that different governments and there have different capacities to implement, uh, you know, uh, climate responses like adaptation, mitigation. So uh, I, my bullet point is leadership, as Laurie has said, we need international cooperation. That's fundamental. And IPCC recognizes that. We need partnerships in terms of research, in terms of uh, technology transfer, capacity building. We need uh, improved governance, both uh, uh, international governments for some of the research issues that are necessary and also national government, strengthening of institutions. So, and moreover, I think that governments are lacking uh, to look at climate change and the opportunities to address this, to limit climate change, uh, the opportunities in so many areas. I think they are looking more from the negative side in terms of how much this is going to cost, etc. But they are not looking at the benefits and the opportunities uh, before uh, before addressing you know climate change and limiting global warming. So I would say that these are my main points. Great, right, thank you. And Marianne, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, Tanma nearly said it all, but uh, I would say uh, a win-win partnership, really, and cooperation to transfer technology uh, that enable access to data, all data, including satellite, all data, and have the infrastructure. This is very important in Africa to process the uh, products that users need both, uh, policymakers and local users. 
Thank you. So we are about to head to our break, but before I do that, I just want to say thank you to Lori, Steve, Thelma, and Marianne. This has been an amazing conversation. And honestly, I hope it's not the first. Uh, I admit when we built our agenda, we were really thinking about changes that had happened in the world in the last year in the United States government and just really trying to say, okay, what can we talk about that will help people understand? Um, in the space world, we often talk about the value of satellites and we, we assume their value, uh, but I really wanted to dig into where are the opportunities and the gaps and, and what could we do to do even more? And, and I think we've done that today. So thank you all so much for being here, for being an amazing kickoff for our Summit for Space Sustainability. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today.